thematic session towards eliminating gender based violence in all its form is hall b and uh, request you all to join us and uh, today uh, dr reenu gawalkar she is chairing the session and she is joining us online and dr gawalkar is director gender and new social inclusion and gender health organization and gender health organization and uh, the speakers for today's session is ms narayana uh, naina choudhary she is the director of programs breakthrough india and i request uh, ms nena if you join us on the dais dr kanika seth she is cyber law expert and founder seth associates and she has joined us online welcome uh, dr kanika and uh, ms shalini kamal she is uh, here and welcome ma'am she is domestic violence evangelist i'm really sorry if i'm not pronouncing it correct and uh, in independent director on boards of about borosil renewals and ambit finvest welcome ma'am and uh, krista is joining us uh, online krista uh, if you can hear us if you can we can check your camera and audio yes can you hear me well I can hear you well and krista is director of influencing and programs asia pacific plan international and let me also take this opportunity to welcome you and uh, today we also joined by ms shanu uh, somvanshi and she is young health program lead plan india shanu please join us on the guys the session today is going to focus on is uh, going to discuss the impact of covid on gender based violence in the community as well as the program in uh, and the problems in assessing that and especially the services around it apart from that the session is also going to explore different examples from government and civil society organizations to prevent gender based violence the session will also discuss uh, identifying priority areas for action for preventing gender based violence and uh, the session will also comprehend and consolidate innovative solutions and approaches to protect and empower the girls i'm going to uh, also introduce the chair so that uh, and then hand over the forum to uh, dr renu dr renu uh, is a director as i said for gender uh, youth and social inclusion with and gender health and she provides technical leadership and support uh, to countries in africa and asia she has more than 18 years of experience in gender transformative and youth friendly programs in the context of sexual and reproductive health gender based violence male engagement and women economic empowerment and life skills and uh, dr renu has a doctorate in sexual and reproductive health for young people and masters in social work and she has extensive work experience in this sector so welcome dr renu and uh, over to you thank you alka and um, hello everyone and uh, thank you so much for joining us today the uh, most important session for us especially during covid times is uh, you know discussing about gender based violence and uh, since alka has already spoken about the background i just wanted to start with a context for why we are discussing this issue today and then i would uh the request the speakers on this panel to share their experience and views so giving the big picture on gender based violence uh, it's a global problem and as per un women one in every 3 women worldwide have reported sexual or physical violence and less than 40% women who have ever experienced gbv seek any kind of support or help gender based violence disproportionately affects low and middle income countries and regions and ever since covid-19 calls to gbv helpline have increased by 5 times globally and 2.5 times in india and the scale of this problem in india especially in the context of covid-19 is nearly 29% spousal violence and we also know that there is tremendous under reporting in india especially for intimate partner violence and sexual violence as per the national commission of women 86% women who face violence do not report or seek help and as per another organization c3 there is increased risk of early child and forced marriage and school closures have made girls even more vulnerable than that they don't even have access to safe space at school and a plan india study conducted in 2020 21 showed increase in digital forms of violence 
cyber bullying and cyber stalking. And this has gone up manifold uh, during COVID-19. So with that background, today this panel is going to uh, discuss the impact of COVID-19 on gender-based violence in the community as well as the problems in accessing services, exploring different examples from government and civil society organizations, identifying priority areas for action for prevention, and exploring and consolidating innovative solutions and approaches to protect and empower the girls. So with that background and context, I would uh, you know, like to invite the speakers on this panel to uh, you know, share with all of us their experience and um, uh, you know, what they have seen in the context of uh, gender-based violence, especially around COVID-19. And, uh, and what would they recommend uh, this group and the ongoing uh, you know, discussions around the National Plan for Action. So the first speaker today would be Ms. Naina Chaudhary. Uh, Naina is the Director for Program at Breakthrough India. She comes with over two decades of experience in the development sector. She has a master's in social work from the University of Delhi and has worked on rights of Dalits and tribals in the grassroots. Naina has worked with reputed philanthropies such as IKEA Foundation and Tata Trusts overseeing multi-state and multi-country grants with focus on marginalized groups in Asia and Africa. She has also been a trainer facilitator focusing on human rights in an international human rights organization. So over to you, Naina, and uh, we'll try and keep this to five to six minutes, please. I'm happy to have a co-social worker you know, uh, happy to know that you have done MSW too. Uh, so uh, thank you for inviting me to speak on this panel, which is extremely important at this point in time. Uh, I represent Breakthrough, which is uh, about 22 year old organization, and it is working towards making gender based discrimination and gender based violence against women unacceptable in the society. That's a very important point that I want to make, that Breakthrough uses culture to change culture. And it believes that you know, only when we change normatively, the culture of violence is going to change. And if women's lives are better, everybody's lives are better. So we have done these campaigns, which uh, we are known for, which are Bel Bajau or Ring the Bell campaign against domestic violence. We have uh, talked about share your story with your son to break the silence uh, uh, around street harassment. We have, we, have dis we have developed a campaign called Dakhal Do, Intervene. Uh, we say that jab awaz uthe, tab hinsa ruke, because we believe that bystander intervention is extremely important. And we know that everybody is not a perpetrator and not an abuser, but because most of us are silent, violence continues. Now coming to the point of during pandemic, um, so uh, the chairperson talked about the problems around violence that exists. And even before the lockdown was announced, we all knew that in a situation whenever families are together for a long time, lockdown in a place, violence increases. This is a known fact. The, uh, the researchers have been pointing this out. And you will see that government of France had already booked 30,000 hotel rooms to prevent uh, domestic violence victims living with, the, uh, living with the perpetrators. So yeah, so ki kind of knew about it. But from the field, we started hearing the the domestic violence cases very early on and domestic violence as I would also like to focus on the domestic violence by brothers and fathers. We talk about intimate partner violence, we talk about violence within marriage, but there is a lot of acceptability about the violence by perpetrated by older brothers and fathers because these are seen as disciplining acts and nobody raises voice against them, but we heard quite a lot. Our adolescents reported about them. 
girls started reporting pressure of marriage early on, very early on. Uh, they also talked about losing the support of their peers. So when, when girls get together, they can support each other. So losing the support of their peers was a great loss. Uh, we also saw that during between the year 2019 and end of 2020, girls actually lost the ability to negotiate further education because there was a definite loss in income in the families. So the gender-based discrimination just stayed and became even more concentrated during the times of lockdown. So those were the experiences that we saw, but we also saw that, that adolescents and young adults showed great resilience by taking the center stage. They actually decided on creating posters and going around the areas that they were in to talk about the khalandazi zaruri hai which actually created this larger campaign that Breakthrough has developed later. So they uh, wrote down all the essential phone numbers. They uh, negotiated with Ashas and Anganwaris to reach out to people. They also wrote in the slide the numbers that women can call on the case of domestic violence. We saw them creating um, groups to develop sanitary pads and make sure everybody gets ration on time. In this time, we realized the need of working intensively with parents, much more intensively than any other time, because in India, in most of the North India, I do not, I, we do not work in South India so much, but most of the North India, we see that there is a, uh, there is a digital divide in terms of gender. So girls are not supposed to touch even mobile phones. So some of our baselines from Uttar Pradesh show that girls believe that if they have touched mobile phones and spoken on mobile phones without permission of parents, it's legitimate to physically beat them up. And this is a time when we were talking about education through digital devices. So we saw there was a great need to intensively work with parents also because the peer support was lost. So the parents had to play dual role of being peers to the adolescents who were not children anymore. Youth groups or teen change leaders were supported during this time and some of them created groups, WhatsApp groups to prevent child marriage. They are still working on. We now see, I, I think, like you said, um, about 3C's research and many other research. Also, UNICEF talked about 30 million girls going to be out of school, 30 million adolescents going to be out of school. So we see a very large uh, amount of dropout happening at this point in time. So one point agenda for breakthrough at this point in time is to make sure that people intervene to get the adolescents back to school, which can work as a safe space for them. The last point that I want to make is one of the unique situations that Breakthrough is facing at this point in time is that we are seeing there is a huge rise in the number of students in the government schools, which is happening because, uh, because of lack of income in the families. So whichever organizations are working in the schools, if they were addressing a class of 20 to 30 students, they are now addressing somewhere between 75 to 90 students. So these are some of the unique situations that we are getting. So that would be my intervention for the first part. Thank you. Thank you so much, Naina. And I really love the way, uh, you know, you described the work that Breakthrough has been doing and uh, you know, something like using culture to change culture. And I think that's something very important. That approach is important when we are trying to go for normative change and gender transformative change. Um, the other uh, interesting thing, and I think we would want to hear more from you during the Q&A round, is uh, the fact that when we talk of violence, mostly in Indian context, we think it's gender-based violence and it's intimate partner violence. But uh, there is also violence which is perpetrated by the other male members in the family, like the older brother and father. And in the context of adolescent girls, those are very important people who make decisions for them. 
So, uh, you know, when we go to the next rounds, we would want to hear more from you about the recommendations around that. And, uh, and also the interesting work that you're doing through the youth networks and youth champions. And that's one, you know, big area that a lot of people, a lot of organizations can leverage. And they are already working like throughout COVID, we know so many youth networks were already working on ground. So thank you so much, Nena, for sharing those. And we would want to hear more from you. Um, uh, the next panelist on our panel is Dr. Karnika Seth. Uh, Dr. Seth is an internationally renowned cyber law expert, founder of Seth Associates, chairperson of Less Siberia at Seth Associates, the world's first integrated cyber laws research forensics and legal consulting center. Dr. Seth has been consistently ranked as top-notch cyber lawyer, an IT expert, author, policymaker, and educator. She is a member of the Global Cybersecurity Forum. She practices law at the Supreme Court of India, Delhi High Court, and other legal forums. She is a part of expert panel of UNICEF, working on children's safety in the online world and is associated with International Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Dr. Seth received the Great Indian Women Award in 2021 from the Indian Observer Post and the eminent CIO of India. So welcome Dr. Karnika Seth to this panel and we would love to hear from you about your experience and work and what you would want to share today with the audience um, you know, around gender-based violence. Thank you so much, Dr. Renu, for this um, you know, opportunity to interact with the, the you know, panelists today and also the, uh, all the audience to, who are actually being able to watch this um, and hear the speakers speak on this very pertinent topic. Um, I think gender-based violence is something which has grown over the years uh, in different dimensions in India specifically. Uh, since I deal with the cyberspace and the crimes, uh, you know, and the cyberspace specifically, I'd like to share my experience on this front. So uh, what we've seen in the last decade or two, and especially during the pandemic, is that uh, you know, gender-based violence has grown phenomenally, especially on the virtual space. You know, if you see this uh, cyber stalking cases, or if you uh, would have looked at the NCRB statistics, for uh, things like sex torsion or uh, fake profiles being created, identity thefts, uh, cheating by personation, these kind of problems have grown many folds. And the reason for that is obviously the cr criminals find this as a very uh, you know safe haven to actually you know perpetrate frauds and you know commit crimes against women. Specifically, when it talks when you talk about uh, social media related frauds, you know social engineering frauds. Those have particularly grown in this uh, you know, time. And um, having said that, what I have seen is uh, the awareness brought right from the school, uh, you know, age group of 13, 12, they're all on online gaming these days, they're on social media, and uh, a lot of fake profiles get generated because of personal issues between peers. Uh, and um, in many schools, this education has still not you know, gone to the level which is required to be given because they are, the children are the ones who are more, more often than others uh, a lot using internet today, whether it's education or it's communication or otherwise. And having dealt with these cases, uh, we, we know that for sure that a lot of, uh, you know, the children who are probably, you know, not even 18 years old, uh, if they're 14, 15, if they're committing these crimes, they're not even aware this is a crime. And that's, that's the point that, uh, you know, they need to be educated on what, what is uh, illegal and what is illegal in cyberspace. They may be just doing some actions gullibly, you know, without realizing that this is actually a crime under the law of the land. So that's something that uh, I've, I've really seen, especially dealing with POXO cases or dealing with the, you know, IT Act cases, in crime against children or uh, crime against girls specific, specifically in this area. And uh, most often they don't realize that there's an electronic trail. The moment there is a particular uh, you know, account created, a fake email ID, for instance, or a fake uh, profile created, it is attached to a particular timestamp and a particular IP address. 
and that that knowledge they don't have so they end up you know committing crimes and later on realize that this is actually a crime whereas on the other hand they would be you know some uh, tech savvy uh, you know persons who would actually perpetrate crimes even adults and uh, they would use software very uh, sophisticated softwares or proxy servers to commit these crimes where they camouflage their real identities so uh, technology allows them to actually hide their real locations and uh, through malware and through spyware they take photographs you know tr trigger the webcams of innocent girls and they would capture pictures and i i'm Firstly, I've seen these lot of these cases where, uh, uh, without the permission of the girl, the, the recordings have been done. Um, they, they have been uh, used to uh, harass the victim later on, and uh, to basically commit cy uh, cyber uh, stalking or sextortion or blackmail or uh, create defamatory posts about them. and long ago even 10 years 15 years ago i've dealt with a case where uh, one uh, you know a uh, young girl was being stalked like this and 15 16 websites were created uh, you know def with defamatory content about her and we had to send them legal notices to the registrars of those websites and to the you know uh, website uh, hosts to remove the content out and as per our law we managed to do that within 36 hours they take that content down but lot of people are not aware um as uh, earlier you know we were just discussing and i think uh, nayana was talking about you know how um, there is under reporting or you know at this point there is so much under reporting happening that people are not aware that there is a cybercrime.gov.in portal also where you can report anonymously and helplines are there and you know there are uh, agencies working on it uh, there there is delhi commission of women then there is national commission of women there are other agencies uh, ngos uh, child line plan india is working so much on the awareness and capacity building uh, they don't reach out they don't reach out to understand uh, you know what is uh, what exactly is the issue and where they can report certain problems and get a legal recourse there are special courts today uh, there are special public prosecutors um even police officers being trained in this area uh in you know cyber safety uh, is an area which is growing and law enforcement is also uh, you know gearing up to it i wouldn't say that we have trained enough but there is an ongoing process and uh, that will help you know uh, basically streamline the whole uh, multi stakeholder approach if you say this is a one person issue it's not it is a multi stakeholder effort and uh, having said that it's important for us to contribute in capacity building right from school school time and uh, you know children and uh, tackle this upfront with law enforcement to capacity building as well so i think uh, with these words i just want to set the tone of this discussion because uh, cyber crime as such has grown phenomenally even 50% or more you know cases in the last one or two years we've seen a huge escalation and a lot of girls are becoming victims of harassment and blackmail more on the internet than elsewhere so that's important for us to uh, educate them on what are the do's and don'ts and what they can do to prevent these problems and uh, you know innocently they share selfies even revenge porn has grown because of that you know you would be aware that this is a lot of issues have emanated because a lot of selfies have been morphed they are not really real also at times so uh, we have to educate everybody on on this and encourage everyone to report and speak up and then uh, you know gear up our law enforcement processes so that we get speedy justice that is very essential because that will restore the faith in the system and encourage others to come forward as well thank you thank you uh, karnika for sharing that and i think that you know there is really a need for a lot of awareness so like you said in the space of cyber crime and cyber bullying stringent laws are not enough we also need you know wider awareness around these things and especially like you know with the digital access the younger adolescents all, are also getting access and they become you know uh, victims as well as perpetrators on this space so there is definitely a need for that and also um, the uh, the need like you said the multi sectoral approach to address this issue and that 
requires engagement from school, from the, you know, all the stakeholders who are involved with this. So working with all of them. So we would like to hear more from you, Karnika, later, you know, in this panel to hear your specific recommendations. Um, thank you so much. The next panelist on uh, this discussion is uh, Ms. Shalini Kamath. Uh, Ms. Kamath is a domestic violence evangelist and independent director on board of uh, ABOT, Borosil New Renewables and Ambit Finvest. Um, Shalini Kamath is an independent director on the boards of ABOT and is an advisory board member with an NGO terrain, creating livelihood for people with disability. She has been the chairperson of FIKI's Women on Corporate Boards mentorship program. She held leadership positions at Chevron Texaco, Star KPMG and Ambit for their India operations. Ms. Kamath worked in Zambia and Botswana where she worked for more than 12 years in community development projects. She's an MBA graduate from Edinburgh Business School, UK, and a certified leadership coach and a Zenger Folkman and Hogan facilitator. She is an evangelist and a voice against domestic violence. We are happy to have you here, uh, Ms. Shalini Kamath, on this panel, and we would love to hear your experience and your interface with gender-based violence, especially during COVID-19 in India. Over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me here. Is this working? Okay. And uh, first of all, congratulations to Plan for taking up uh, this uh, the whole theme, uh, theme of uh, you know building back, which is very very important in today's time. Uh, and also for you know bringing this topic and having conversations around it because it's very important that we speak about issues and social challenges that our society faces because if we don't talk about it we will not be able to resolve it uh, and especially domestic violence because it's a very very complex problem it's not that easy uh, it isn't something which, which is just one cause and that can help it's a worldwide problem it happens all over uh, it affects both uh, the developed world and the developing world you see it in both uh, to highly educated people or to illiterate women uh, financially independent and dependent uh, whether they are from any class whether they are rich or whether they are poor uh, it happens within the confines of a home, which is a personal space. So it is very difficult for interventions because that's a sacrosanct space and you, you, you know, others can't just go in there. And that's why I liked your focus on Dakhal though, because most people don't want to interfere and intervene. Uh, it's, it's a home front. Mm, a lot many times even the victim doesn't realize that they are going through abuse until and unless it's physical abuse because all other forms of abuse just get they don't even find any place of mention and also because it's a cycle of abuse it is not constant in somebody's life so it happens then there is i hope everybody's aware of the cycle that there is this you know period when it brews and then the actual incident happens and then the rationalizing uh, period which is the honeymoon period where everything is absolutely fine hunky dory there are apologies everybody gets together the calm phase and then it comes back again so through that cycle the victim is lost as well to say am i really abused or not because there are good periods there as well uh, then the the victim doesn't want to even if they know they don't want to acknowledge it or they don't want to report it because there are so many things that are going on in the mind there is shame there there is guilt there is it because of me have i done something wrong there are no options there are no places where they can go to there's no support uh, sometimes it's just depression low self-esteem so there are many reasons fear that you know something would happen or their children will be taken away so it's very difficult for them to report uh, the perpetrator generally feels that this is something very normal what is the big thing i mean i just hit or i you know slapped or or there was this abuse so what's the big deal there was something that the person didn't do right so i have the right to do it right so even in the perpetrator's mind it is not really anything wrong you know grossly wrong that they are doing uh, the society, <laughs> they want to keep it hidden. 
you know, I call this the Facebook culture, where everything is good in the world. There is nothing. Our families are the best. Our children are the best. Our husbands are the best. Nobody wants to talk and talk about the the problems that are there within families. So the society doesn't want to talk about it. And the government, uh, government has many other bigger things to do than worry about this. They have politics, first of all, just keeping their chairs in place. Then they have all kinds of economy related, job related, national security, international you know, development and uh, natural disasters. There's just so much happening that this becomes like one insignificant thing that features somewhere in their list of things that is there. So with so many things that are there that are happening, it becomes a very complex problem. How do you solve such a complex issue? Thank God there are NGOs, uh, they care. They pick this up because they care about it, right? So they, at least the social sector tries whatever that they can do to help. Let's look at the root cause. Why does domestic violence happen? If you look at it, it's a very simple thing. It's the need of one human being to control and show power over another human being. That's where it brews from. And a belief system somewhere in the head that there is a, a, a gender which is superior. Either it is a gender superiority or it is a financial superiority. Uh, wherever, whoever has the money is the powerful and the superior. That's the notion that they come with. So that's another root cause because of which this happens. So the topic today is how do we eliminate domestic violence? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to be pessimistic, but I don't think we can eliminate gender uh, uh, domestic violence. We maybe can reduce it. Maybe that is an area that everybody together, but to do that, there has to be a very strong long-term commitment of behavior and mindset change. Because if you look at all the problems that are there and the complexity of the situation, it brews from behavior and mindset change. And that also at a societal level. So what is this change that we want to see? It's a very simple change. The change that we want to see or that can help reduce it is that all humans are born equal. They have equal right to dignity, equal equality to rights. If every individual can accept it and start working towards it, only then we would be able to see some change. So what, how do we do it? What do we do around it? First of all, it is at the individual level. Where are girls, where the women? Uh, we from day one are taught and we have self-belief in our own equality. We have the confidence, we have the self-esteem, we get the education that we, we all deserve. Uh, and the education, I don't mean just reading science and math and social studies and getting a job, but actual life skills are taught to both boys and girls. How to live in a family together, how to respect differences of genders, differences of humans that are there, cultural differences conflict resolution, anger management, homemaking. How do you do homemaking? Why is it always a responsibility only of one gender? It should be taught, right? All these little things that are taught to us in school, which produces human beings that are holistic in their thinking. And I'm a very, very strong believer that we need to get back self-defense training for everybody, including women. You know, they need to be able to physically defend themselves if the need ever arises. So this whole piece around the individual. At the family level, I think that's the biggest, like you said, Lena, that you realized during this period, or somebody mentioned, that during this period we've realized everything is with the family. The family is the next that can actually do something about it. What can they do? Two simple things. First, within your own homes, reduce patriarchy, remove misogynistic statements. I mean, I hear such simple things in homes, right? A, a child will come and ask something, Papa ko ja ke pooch lo. I mean, Papa is the deciding factor. Why not mother? Ma se bhi pooch lo. No, little things that are there like that, which just kind of, shadi karke tum apne ghar chale jao. I mean, this is not your home or what, right? There are these little, little things that are there. Bhaiya ke saath jao, akele mat jao. 
I mean, you always need a man everywhere. So these little things that we treat, the way we bring up, our, and there's been a lot of discussion on how the girls are discriminated against food, education, everything. So all of that, the whole equality piece over there. And please, if, unfortunately, if your daughters, daughter-in-laws, uh, sisters, uh, aunts, nieces, anybody is in an abusive relationship, stand by them, support them, give them what they need to be able to come out of it. Because this research has proven that abusive relationships don't change. It won't happen that the perpetrator will change. That won't happen. So there is only a binary uh, uh, situation here. You live with it and suffer it through your life or you come out of it and build a separate life. So help them, support them in that. At the community level, I'm completely with you. Please intervene. Don't just accept it. Say a word, stand by it, raise it, go to the police, ring a bell, do whatever you can, but do something. Don't just be a bystander. Provide that support which is required. At the society level, uh, it's a... Uh, uh, you know, it's a whole lot. I don't even know where to begin and where to end in such a short period that is there. Uh, but f the first thing that we can do is, is if we can stop accepting, normalizing, and glorifying domestic uh, violence. I mean, there's a glorification. You suddenly switch on the television, you would see there's a man, he gives one tight job and it goes cuts, cuts, cuts 10 times of the same thing and everybody is watching glued to it, accepting that this is normal. It is not normal. It is not right. Now, so this whole piece at the societal level and at the state level, again, there is just no end to it. It is right from legislation, like somebody just mentioned and such a lovely thought, I thought. I said, where is the equality even in marriage? A boy is, uh, is legally allowed to marry at 21, but a girl can marry at 18. There is no equality even there. Right? So right from legislation to policies, uh, to ensuring that the law enforcement system works, the police system works, there's a legal sound system that operates and there is PD handling of things, there are social policies, the whole piece around, you know, women and child that is there. Uh, and this can only happen if everybody works together in an integrated fashion, which is from your from your law and law making to law enforcement to social workers academia private sector uh, 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 social uh, society organizations civil society organizations all of them work in unison maybe through some form of coordinating committees or agencies that bring them together so that the resources are pulled in and then there is an impact uh, I will take a pause here because then there are some things that I feel that each one of us can do, uh, which we shall cover later. And thank you for uh, uh, allowing me to speak, uh, Dr. Rainey. Thank you, Shalini Ji. Thank you for the passion and commitment that you bring to this work. And it's really amazing to hear the simple steps that you know you are suggesting and and also the fact that there is so much of hush hush around gender based violence there is so much of you know everyone just wants to push it under the carpet nobody wants to talk about it and and the society's perception and the survivors perception of gbv is also so important and i think one of the recommendations we will come to the recommendations later but you have already shared and it's a very important one that a lot of civil society organizations are already working on GBV, but they're working in their own bubbles. Every organization has, you know, some intervention on gender-based violence or the other, but I think, you know, it's important to have that everyone coming together and coordinating their intervention so that we are covering all the levels of individual, family, community, health system, legal system, policy, all of that. So because it's not possible for one organization to cover all bases, but it's possible for all organization to cover their niche areas and then come together and coordinate. So let's talk about that, you know, when we start discussing the recommendations for the national action plan. And I also really liked uh, the fact that you talked about life skills and how important it is to impart life skills to both boys and girls and not only talk about you know the ideal woman and ideal mother thing only to girls but also you know talking about 
uh, you know, being an ideal human being, and it's irrespective of the gender or the biological sex. Um, so with that, uh, we have our next panelist with us, and uh, Krista Zimmerman. Krista is the Director of Influencing and Programs Asia Pacific with Plan International. She leads the organization's regional influencing and program team, which is focused on gender transformative advocacy, civil society strengthening research and program strategy in Asia Pacific. Ms. Zimmerman also works through 15 country programs and five national offices in Asia Pacific Plan International to help advance girls' rights and gender equality. Before joining PLAN, Ms. Zimmerman worked for several other non-government organizations and practiced labor and human rights law in the private sector. She holds a Juris Doctor from the University of Notre Dame. So over to you, Krista, and we would love to hear your uh, thoughts, experience, and what you would want to share with today's audience. Thank you so much, Dr. Reno, and also to all of the other panelists um, who have said so many wise and smart things. I, I hope I won't just be repeating, but let's see. <laughs> um, of course, we know that COVID-19 has significantly affected people across the Asia Pacific region, and of course, in India as well. And that although some countries are recovering faster than others, the social health and economic impacts of this pandemic will remain with us for many years. And we would also be remiss not to understand how many of these impacts are going to exacerbate gender-based violence in our societies and possibly lead to more gender-based violence in the future if we're not successful at mitigating it. Some have referred to this increase in vulnerability to gender-based violence on the part of women and girls, in fact, as the shadow pandemic. Girls and young women experiencing abuse often live with or are close to those who perpetuate gender-based violence, and this has been mentioned by others. But of course, we know this means that lockdowns, work from home, study from home, may increase exposure to gender-based violence while reducing reporting routes, awareness, and psychological and physical care opportunities. One of the things that we haven't talked so much about, um, in this session at least, is that the pandemic has also worsened basic economic conditions for many families, pushing some women and girls into more dangerous, low-paying work that puts them at risk of violence and exploitation in those workplaces, not just at home. And of course, the stress and anxiety that families are experiencing can also lead to increased propensity for violence in the home. All of these things worry me a great deal, um, but I think perhaps one of the things that worries me the most is the serious setback that so many countries in this region could be facing in terms of preventing child early and forced marriage. I mean, child marriage is not just a serious violation of the rights of the child and a form of gender-based violence. It is a long-term impediment to economic progress and inclusive development. And it also perpetuates other forms of gender-based violence, such as domestic abuse and intimate partner violence. UNICEF has estimated that COVID-19 could lead to 10 million more girls than would have experiencing child marriage worldwide. And additionally, the disruption of, of what so many have seen as non-essential services during this pandemic, things like reproductive health services, have a direct impact on teenage pregnancy and subsequently on child marriage. But the other thing I do wanna say about this too is I think um, you know, to mirror a little bit what, a, what, what another panelist said about domestic violence, um, are we going to eliminate it anytime soon? Probably not. We're going to try our hardest, but we have to also recognize that, that many people are going to go through it. So in addition to increasing our efforts, I think, to prevent child marriage, we must also do a lot more, everything in our power, to support those girls who are married young and who are more vulnerable to gender-based violence uh, as a result of that uh, mitigating all of the potential harms of early marriage and early motherhood. 
And we must put more effort into both raising awarenesses, of course, of the harms of, of child marriage in order to reduce and prevent it. But we also have to do that while ensuring that we are not increasing stigmatization and isolation of those who will become child brides. I think this is a very important piece of work as we talk about how we're going to you know, also support people um, who, who are in uh, early marriages. And I'm very excited that Plan India uh, will be launching a comprehensive program around this with a legal component to reach out to child brides and to help families, to focus on ensuring that young brides have access to rights and entitlements even after their marriage. Um, but yeah, I think to combat the shadow pandemic, we must proactively put young girls and women at the center of our response and recovery, recovery process throughout the board, looking at all of the things that both result from gender-based violence, but also the things that have the propensity to increase gender-based violence. Uh, with, in, in my opinion, child marriage being at the heart of this intersection for many, many young girls. Thank you, Krista. And um, yeah, thank you so much for sharing, you know, your concern. And, and it is actually an alarming uh, growth that is projected for the early child and forced marriages. And I quite agree with you. And um, and what Shalini ji said about that, while we talk about eliminating all forms of violence, we don't see that happening in the near future. It still looks like a far cry. And so it is important for us to, you know, focus all our efforts at eliminating, but also making sure that the survivors of gender-based violence, and especially the survivors and uh, the girls who are getting married early get, have access to all the resources and services that they need so that they are not facing the further vulnerability of becoming a child bride. And, and also uh, that this again sets in a vicious cycle of you know, the economic vulnerability and then again a poor fallback position, a poor bargaining position, and again uh, stuck in that cycle of violence and not, not finding an escape. So while we are discussing eliminating all forms of violence, we have to be really mindful and intentional in, in providing comprehensive services to survivors of all forms of violence. And thank you so much, Krista, for you know, bringing that uh, up front and central here. And today, the last speaker on our panel is Plan India's um, own uh, Shanu Somvanshi. Shanu is the Young Health Program Lead for Plan India, and she brings technical expertise in health, gender, livelihoods, and innovation. Her career is focused on reducing income poverty, promotion of gender wage parity, and youth advocacy. Shanu has expertise in the design and implementation of projects from district level to multinational level, like United Kingdom, Uganda, Malawi, India, Guatemala, Cameroon, and Kenya. She is adept at evidence, strategic planning, stakeholder management, partner management, capacity building, documentation, and advocacy. Shanu has been associated with international organizations like Plan International Global Hub, Plan International India, and International Development Enterprises. She is in the final semester of PhD in Feminist Studies. So over to you, Shanu, and we would love to hear the kind of work that you are doing for Plan India to uh, you know, eliminate gender-based violence, especially the experience around COVID-19. So Renu, uh, am I audible? Thank you, uh, Dr. Renu, and um, thanks to all the panelists, my co-panel members who have shared their different experience of different spaces. We did discuss on several issues, so maybe in this limited time, I will share Plan India's work on the different domain, so that after understanding about the domestic violence, after understanding about the COVID, what the other organization has done, cybercrime, something new we can share in this platform. And thanks to, uh, before starting, I would like to thanks to all audience who have joined online 
and who are in front of me. So basically, we did discuss about uh, COVID, as Dr. Renu had said. Like for Plan India, uh, children, vulnerable children, adolescent, at the heart of all the planning. Whatever activity we do, we keep an eye that at least all children would be protected. There should not be any discrimination. They would be prevented from any type of violence. Uh, during COVID, especially, we took care that uh, even the career uh, counseling or any form of education we should provide through digital medium as well. So several activities we did by forming group, either reaching to them through the online medium or offline medium, through telephone. So very innovative effort we did so that children and young people, adolescents would be aware. With male member, we kept an eye that they should be aware how they can become a positive ally to the female. And with the female, we have worked that they should know their rights, they should know their action, what they are doing and how they will be uh, prevented from any sort of crime. Going about the COVID, I would say there is a study of uh, United Nations, uh, shadow the pandemic. So uh, for COVID-19, for violence against women, where it was like one in two women either knows about the violence or she has faced the violence. So that means with COVID, the intensity of violence has increased. And that means uh, violence can happen anywhere, not it's that inside the home it will happen during the public transport, going to home, going to safe space, violence can occur. So any place, either inside home, outside home, during the way, it can happen. Even online it happened, even carrying the phone, the violence can occur. So digital, Dr. Kanika has rightly mentioned. And if I uh, go through the data of National Crime Record Bureau, NCRB of 2021, then it says that there is a dip of 8.3% of reported crime during this COVID-19 period where the crime has happened. Seriously, I think about that, whether this report is correct, whether at the community level when we work, we know what has happened, whether that was correct or the NCRB data is correct. And when I, uh, when you read the National Commission of Women, then it says that 23,722 cases are reported, which is the highest from the past six years. So definitely, as my co-panel member have said, there are unreported cases and they're underreported as well. And of course, violence against can be coined as a silent and tabooed issue, sometimes with our hesitation or any be any reason, but it hardly been expressed. If I go to the World Economic Forum report, then again, it says that India slipped 28 places and reached at the rank of 140 out of 156 country. That means it is the third worst country in South Asia. So overall, I truly agree that yes, we need to work with all the institution, with all the organization from community level to government level, so that at least we can increase, we can reach to the last mile of the community. Drawing from uh, this experience, I mean, regarding what we have done and uh, after listening to domestic violence, mental illness, cybercrime, I would like to share one program of plan because of short of time. So out of the 40 years experience of plan, it's a project which we did in the backward district of Ambedkar Nagar, the Uttar Pradesh, which you are aware. So there what has happened, when we reach to the informal setting, then whatever the laws are, we have the laws, we have POSH, we have TERA, we have Equal Remunerative Act, we have uh, the Prevention of Sexual uh, Harassment Act. But where the implementation is, there's hardly any implementation. When we reach to the community, then we realize women, when their uh, husband migrate, they are at home, but they require money. So they have to reach to the workplace. What happened from behind the veil, 
at the workplace she reaches without any exposure without any education of workplace laws workplace condition bargaining a skill and there she was trapped the perpetrator for the perpetrator it was very easy to ask whatever to be done and she was bound to done because she has to deal with household chores she has to perform all the duties had to bear the expenses of the home as well so looking at that situation plan india did the networking with different department first because in india there are different department they are expert in this but how much reach they are making at the community level that is very important so with department of labor we did the networking so that every women would be aware of the labor laws we educated them with the panchayati raj institution we took a resource center we provided uh information uh, settings to them so that they had a exposure to the department labor scheme job cards from narega so that work opportunity would be increased they would avail more work so from just a limited work 30 days work say for example they can reach it so that option we had increased then we also uh, liaison with banking institution bank are so good that when they realize that women require then on one day the the mobile banking facility we had availed and all women had received the bank account option they opened it so uh, we advocated with the employer i mean women collective did the advo uh, advocacy so that employer would transfer the money to the bank account of the women apart from it when the bargaining power of women increased through our initiative then obviously the backlash of the male was there inside the home and then the situation from violent behavior from outside inside also happened but with gradual effort and sharing on information and plus increase in leadership and bargaining skill instead of giving one option two option women usually increase the ability to put her side of a story in front of the people and were able to convince so then the good situation also became there and then household bargaining skill that the women had learned so this is uh, looking at the time i am just uh, giving just example that in workplace also this situation agrees and uh, uh we have worked in this covid time also uh, in connection with the women through digital medium so that women would know what to do and uh, innovative hybrid model also in the department of labor we created so that through online version they would know the scheme they would do the work so this sort of work we have done and since there are other examples of child marriage and other work but um, the time constraint is there and since uh, before ending uh, uh, this year we lost uh, kamla bhasin ji so with the couplet of her which says that to fight men uh, to fight men i must study to uh, end my silence i must study to uh, challenge patriarchy i must study to demolish all hierarchy i must study so i think we all as an organization should unite and think that how we can educate all adolescent and women especially of the last mile about the workplace or any of the uh, uh, laws and schemes relevant to gender equality especially we should teach them uh, so with this saying thank you thanks a lot for listening to me thanks a lot thank you shanu and thank you for that wonderful ode to kamila bhasin ji she remains the guiding light for the cause of gender equality not only for india but globally and uh, and shanu i also really you know i really liked what you said uh, you know which uh, which did not get covered in the panel today the backlash and one of the one of the challenges of any intervention which leads to which tries to challenge the patriarchal norms is the potential unintended harm and backlash on women on adolescent girls and sometimes also on project teams and uh, i think when we discuss the recommendations this is something i would like to hear from any of you about you know what you are doing in your projects your experience around 
um, addressing issues around backlash and talking about the do no harm framework for projects. And, um, and Shanu, thank you so much for sharing that experience on um, empowering women at workplace and you know the awareness around labor laws. And that's again, such an important piece that uh, you know, as uh, we are also working with girls and vocational training, what kind of other, you know, elements that, you know, we need to integrate within the vocational skills. It's also the awareness about labor laws. It's not just preparing them to work, but also making them aware about what are their rights at workplace and what are the laws and policies which protect that. Um, so thank you so much. I mean, we've, we have incredible panelists, but since this is the last session and it's delayed, we are kind of rushing through, but still we will try and you know cover all the important bases here. So just to kind of wrap up whatever we have discussed till now, it's, um, you know, we've highlighted the importance of looking at all forms of gender-based violence with a specific focus on early child forced marriage um, the, you know, emotional violence, economic violence, cyber, you know, based, gender-based violence. And so, you know, moving forward, I think we would also want to focus on what role can civil society play in eliminating all forms of gender-based violence. And the most important question, will our strategy be focused on response mechanism only? That means gender-based violence helplines, shelter homes, legal support, et cetera, or will we also take a hard and intentional look at addressing the root causes of GBV and, and try to address the patriarchal mindsets, gender power dynamics, and other causes? The second important question is, you know, these social norms and patriarchal mindsets also lead to a perpetrator thinking that it is okay for them to use violence against women, girls, and children. So how are we going to you know, design our strategies around addressing these mindsets? And thirdly, these norms also push the survivor, blame themselves for the violence, and often for the society to think that gender-based violence is okay and normal, especially in the face of COVID-19 pandemic, we have seen so many times people saying that, you know, the man has lost his job. You know, please understand the stress he's going through. So what if he slapped her? So what if he threw her out of the house? So, you know, trying to justify violence in the face of COVID-19 pandemic. So how are we going to, you know, focus our strategies at addressing these? So these are some of the questions that I would like us all to reflect upon. But I have some specific guiding questions for our panelists. So uh, the first question I want to ask uh, Shalini Kamarji. Shalini, you know, you have so much of experience working with the survivors. So in your opinion, are the current services to prevent and respond to gender-based violence, are these well-equipped to handle the peaks in demand period? And how can we ensure that women and girls feel secure in reaching out for help? It's a tough one, uh, Renu, and I, I will be as honest as I can be in an open forum of this nature. Uh, we are a, a developing nation. Uh, we have limited resources. Uh, and those resources get channelized into areas which uh, either the state thinks that are the most important uh, or uh, are sometimes politically required, uh, so they get channelized there. Unfortunately, domestic violence does not form or is not somewhere at the level of awareness that at it should be to get the kind of support or resources that is required. So if we just step back and see, what are we talking about? We are talking about nearly 50% of our population is women. Let's say 30% of this is in the girl and adult girl and women. 
that's a very large number of women, right? Then we are saying that one in three, or in the pandemic situation, one in two have experienced. That means 50% of millions and millions of women go through domestic violence. Despite that, is it anywhere in the, in the hierarchy of uh, things that we talk about or is at the national level? So I think the first thing that we need to do is, is we need to bring the enormity of the situation, the scale of which the suffering is center stage. Because if it doesn't come center stage, it will not get the resources. So, so that's the first thing that we need to. What is the current state? Uh, I would say in pockets, there are places where people can go seek help. Uh, in pockets, there's just nothing at all. It's very sketchy. It is not standardized. It's not uniform. It's not the level where uh, each segment of society can go. For a certain segment, it could still be, you know, uh, at least some, some place that they can access. For the others, it would just be unthinkable to go, go there. So it's, 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 a, it's not a situation that one can say one is happy with or can be proud of. There's a lot that needs to be done, but it will not be done till there is enough awareness that is created. There is clarity and there is discussion to raise the importance of the problem, and only then that support would be provided. Thank you, Shalini ji. And I, I agree with you. I mean, it's not uh, something quite straightforward as of now. And, uh, and let's see, I mean, you know, today this panel is going to also think of some specific recommendations that we can, you know, bring together for the civil society organizations, for the government and policymakers, and see how and, you know, what we can do to bring this issue up front and central and get all the attention that it needs and then also the resources. My next question is to Shanu Somvanshi. Um, Shanu, based on all the work that you've been doing, how can women and girls be educated about their rights and symptoms of abuse in all its forms, including mental and physical violence? Thank you, uh, Dr. Reno. Uh, I would say uh, that since it is not defined that at what age, what type of violence or abuse a girl is going to face. And if we look at the age, then from zero to any age, uh, the girl is vulnerable to any form of violence. So the best is to design the module with the uh, laws, with the preventive measure, and uh, with the how, where to register grievances in that method. And then as like a school curriculum, we start, maybe that as a thing we can do that age wise something along with all the activities like we are te teaching alphabet to the doctorate degree maybe how to prevent from this violence we can teach to girls and yes that there should be a formal method to it and with male member we can sh uh, really teach them about how they can support girls positive masculinity that we can teach so this is what my answer is. Apart from it, whether it be the pandemic or not, maybe something as an innovative model we should think that how we can make a reach to the girl and educate her or how she can prevent herself from any form of abuse. So this is the effort we can do. Thank you. Thank you, Shanu. And I really like that you bring back the focus on talking to children about good touch, bad touch. And, and talking to them about the different forms of abuse based on their age and their understanding. And there are a lot of models that, you know, the best practices that can be used with younger age group versus the older age group. And, um, and I also wanted to understand from Nayana Chaudhary, uh, Nayana, you know, the kind of work that your organization is doing, I think you are best placed to answer this question. Uh, how can the societal taboo of not talking about abuse in homes be broken and those who experience violence made comfortable in sharing their stories? 
first part of the question is actually an answer to the second part of the question. Like you have to break this taboo against uh, the victims of domestic violence speaking out, which Shalini ji have already spoken about. You know, I think the best that we can do is to make sure that we believe the victim. We always stand by the victim and believe the victim. Whenever the victim is speaking out herself, her version should, should take priority. Yeah, this is the first thing I'm going to talk about. The second thing is that, you know, uh, both Krista and Shalini ji spoke about violence, and you also agreed that violence may not be eliminated in near future, may not be during our lifetime. But my hope is pinned on making this unacceptable, you know, under any circumstances. I want a society in which everybody says that whenever there is a violence, they just stand up and say it is not acceptable. I say that this is going to happen, this has happened, there are bad people, there are different kinds of people, but it is not acceptable. Murder also happens, right? Do we say murder is acceptable? We don't. Then why do we say domestic violence is acceptable? So this is the second thing that I'm going to say. The third thing is, are you listening? So are you listening as a person who's a neighbor? Are you listening as a person who's, um, who's part of the family? Are you listening as a person who's part of the system, which is going to respond to this victim? Very recently, I was asked by a journalist that, uh, you know, you remember that TikTok video in which a victim can make a hand gesture and say that she's in a situation like this. In our country, victims actually reach to the police station and they are sent back with the perpetrator saying that it's a household matter. Please keep it wrapped within the household. So unless there is a, there is a shift in the mindset saying that we do not accept violence under any circumstances it's it's i can't put it on the victim to speak about it she she is already facing it it can't be on her to protect herself to speak for herself and to stand up unless we are all there to stand by her so that's the that's the shift that we need to see in the world to make violence against women unacceptable yeah thank you thank you nana completely agree with you on that and karnika i mean coming to you you bring so much of expertise on this new new emerging form of violence the cyber bullying and the, the digital space violent so how can we strengthen the existing services for addressing violence against women and girls especially on the digital space and what are some of the capacity building requirements to improve the quality of response yes i think uh, capacity building is uh, one of the i think most important aspects of preventing this kind of you know uh, violence in uh, from growing uh, what we see in terms of figures, uh, already we see a more than 400% rise in the last few years, you know, of, of uh, especially uh, cyber crimes against women. Uh, they may have been a dip in the offline violence, but, uh, you know, certainly in the digital space, we see a lot of rise. Uh, capacity building has to be right from uh, school time, you know, school uh, curriculum. Like we talk about the well-being, we talk about, you know, different other aspects of uh, education. Uh, teaching them about netiquette is, I think, a very important aspect of, uh, you know, schooling now. And it's it can't be, uh, you know, understated at this point, having uh, seen the kind of uh, glaring instances of, you know, growing, uh, like incidents like boys' locker room or otherwise, uh, we've seen in the in reported, uh, you know, uh, incidents of even, uh, I would say, uh, sex torsion rackets or uh, uh, other trolling and sexting and other kinds of problems which have emanated with this platform. So um, right from school time, uh, you know, the, the, 
I would say the imparting of education is important, and I was fortunate to even work with NCRT on uh, such, uh, you know, a guidance uh, of such videos, uh, which can help in disseminating this information. And uh, fortunately, in the pandemic, you know, over 50 institutions we worked with, uh, educating them on cyberbullying and other kinds of violence, especially educational institutions. And that was across more than 14, 15 states, because that was the only way which, uh, you know, they could reach out and train their children and, you know, our younger generation or other, other kinds of problems which were emanating in the COVID times. So gender-based violence specifically grew. And uh, another aspect which is important in terms of capacity building is to strengthen the law enforcement. Strengthening the law enforcement will help, uh, you know, deal with these problems. Because, right, as you rightly said, when you go to the police station, they don't register complaints. Now, same as with technology-related problems, they say it's all happened virtually. What is the harm? What is the physical harm that has been caused? It's not something which is, you know, uh, tangible. We we don't see anything. So we have to show them screenshots. We have to see the kind of harassment which has been caused, the defamation which has been caused, and other kinds of, you know, violence uh, online. Sometimes the mobile numbers of the you know, victim have been floated online and she's been getting hundreds of calls every day uh, with some uh, explicit, sexually explicit content of uh, you know, morph pictures and videos. So this uh, educating the police force, educating even the, I would say, judicial officers who are dealing with these cases, how they treat electronic evidence uh, was another challenging aspect because uh, even from screenshots to messages to whatever you'd like to submit as a footprint that this has been you know, committed from this particular handset or this particular phone is itself a challenge, how to prove electronic evidence. So uh, I think capacity building has to be across all stakeholders, not just uh, younger like generation of children, the people who are going to be actually looking at these crimes, the judicial officers who will be adjudicating these matters, and uh, even uh, capacity building in terms of training the trainers. I feel is important, you know. So it, it can't be a particular institution's job alone. So it has to be a, a mutual effort and everybody needs to stand up, you know, to do this. So it's a, it's a, it's a not something which is small. It's going to be a mammoth exercise, but then it has to be a concerted effort. Yeah, thanks, Karnika. And I agree with you. This requires a multi-sectoral approach and every stakeholder who is either influencing or getting affected by the cyberspace bullying, digital space violence, they all have to come together and that capacity building needs to happen with all of them. Thank you so much, Karnika. And Krista, you know, based on your experience with Plan International in this region, working with so many countries, you know, I wanted to understand from you, how can we put young girls and women at the center of response and recovery process in a way that their voices and perspectives inform the design that we are going to make? Yeah, that's a great question. And I'm really happy to be able to answer it because I think one of the things that we we see so often um, whenever we're hit with a crisis is that we, we sometimes forget the things that we know <laughs> because we're so um, focused on responding to this crisis and you know everything feels chaotic and rushed. And I think sometimes we just have to remember we need to go back to the basics, the things that we know that work about how you make social change and how you ensure that, you know, the people that you're trying to make social change with and for are part of the process. There was a phrase, I think that was, I don't know where it was originated exactly, but I was introduced to it when I worked in uh, Latin America where, where indigenous communities would often say, nothing about us without us. Which is don't come up with plans and programs for us if you're not going to put our voices at the center. And I think, you know, we know what works. We have to take the time to meaningfully consult with women and girls when we are designing interventions. And even if it's a crisis, and even if everything is up in the air and an emergency, we have to make it a priority. Can't just shut, shove it to the side. And then beyond making time, you know, we have to focus on what, how we can do it meaningfully. 
So this means inclusive spaces, spaces where women's voices and children's voices um, can be heard. So for example, even just in a community meeting where you have men and women together, we know that if you give the floor to men first, that men will take up the majority of the space and speak the most often. Research has shown it. If you call on women first, the space will be shared more equally between men and women. But the minute you give priority to men's voices, they will dominate and take up most of the space in the room. So we have to go back to what we know is good development practice. Ensure that we're creating inclusive spaces. And then I think you know, with girls, we have to also make sure that those spaces are age appropriate um, and that children of both genders are given a chance to participate as well as adults. And, you know, I think sometimes there's this idea that, that, that children can't weigh in on weighty issues. Uh, but we know that if you do it right, that you can hear from children and give them a voice in the process. Plan India has developed a workshop for children um, from communities to express their pandemic using art. And I've been um, part of consultations with children where we use different methodologies like games and body mapping in order to make sure that children's voices could be heard. And of course, whenever um, you're working on an issue specifically like gender-based violence, it's also really important that there are safe spaces and that the way that women and girls are consulted uh, is in a way that, that there won't be a backlash as we discussed before and which will help keep them safe. And of course, whenever we're taking a survey or doing any kind of consultation around gender-based violence, this is really critically important. And I just wanna say one thing too, I mean, this was touched on earlier, but we've seen with this pandemic that the importance of digital spaces and telecommunication telecommunication technology are so important. And that means if we wanna give girls and women a voice, we need to break down the gender digital divide. Indian women are 15% less likely to own a mobile phone and 33% like, less likely to use mobile internet services. And just last year in a survey, 25% of the total female adult population uh, said they owned a smartphone versus 41% of adult men. So more and more in the future, in order for their voices to be heard, it means we have to make sure they have the same access to telecommunication technology as well. Thank you, Krista. And thank you for sharing, you know, this uh, example. I especially, you know, want to refer back to the example you gave about the research, which shows that when you offer the podium to a man versus a woman, and, you know, related to that, it's also said that as a girl grows, her space shrinks, and as a boy grows, his space expands. And we see that in the way, you know, societies teach girls how to sit. And uh, on aircrafts, you see, especially when how a woman sits while, you know, as compared to how men sit. And it's also about teaching girls to shrink their space and through our interventions we have to again undo a lot of these things and teach girls and boys to share that space rather than shrinking or expanding each other's space um and uh, before yeah. you close i want to say something very related to what you just uh, said can no, i take are, a moment is that yes, okay with you but we are not closing i'm going to come back to all of you for your recommendations you can go ahead and share what you want to say. This because we we this is something which is very close to my heart, Please which all of us can do. Please go uh, ahead. One thing that each participant and anybody who's sitting here can do is start questioning gender roles and stereotypes around in your own life. And I will share two examples because that may just help people. As I was in the flight today in the morning and they made an announcement, they said the pilot today is a woman and the gentleman who was doing the services who was announcing was a male. And I thought to myself, 35 years ago or 40 years ago when I would travel, we couldn't even think that there would be a woman pilot. It was always a man pilot and all the air hostesses were women. Somebody 
questioned it to say, why can't I be a pilot? And that one person brought in this whole breed. Another example I will share. When I got married many years ago, there was a ritual that is there and our religious and, and marriage rituals really need to be questioned. So please question them. So there was a ritual where whenever there was a puja that was happening, a ceremony, uh, my husband would do all everything and I just had to hold his arm. That is all that my role was. And I just followed it. You know, you're young, you just follow. After a few years, I felt, but why? I'm earning, I'm educated. Why do I do that? So what I did is I said, okay, next time when we do puja, why don't we take turns of every family member doing the ceremony? And we shifted it. Now there are children, our daughters, our sons, everybody participates. Why I'm sharing this is because I'm not saying question it just to ruffle things. Yes, but question to understand what is the logic behind it. If the logic is not with a gender bias, follow it. But if there is, try change it a little. I will give you one more example. Our son just got married and the daughter-in-law was very keen and her family that the kanyadan should be done. Now coming from where I come from, kanyadan is like to say, why are you giving away? You're not giving away your daughter. She's more educated or equally educated as our son. So we said, okay, why don't we do this? Because it matters to me as a mother-in-law that no, a daughter who's coming to our household, there's no kanyadan that is happening, but they want to do it. So we said, fine. After the Kanyadan, we did repeated exactly the same ritual with our son and called it Vardan. And we gave the var away to the other family. So you find things to break those stereotypes and roles. And that would something I would want to say to each and every participant who's hearing, do that in your own sphere, in your own way. And slowly the change would come. Sorry, Renu, I just pulled it, but I had to share this. Don't apologize. Thank you so much for sharing those wonderful examples. See, it's, you know, it's always better to speak practical things around gender equality than, than talk in jargons and technical terminologies. What you've said is exactly what we need to do as a society and each one of us. Like gender transformative change begins from us and, and in our own space. So thank you so much for sharing that. And we are definitely not closing right now. I'm going to come back to each one of you to ask for your recommendations. And uh, Shalini, the example you shared about the woman pilot, somebody did question that in India, why are girls not allowed in the National Defense Academy? And see where we are. We had the first batch which will come out this uh, January. Um, so going back to uh, the last part of this uh, session today, as you know, that Plan India is doing this two-day conference because they want and we want to build back better with girls. So all the discussions during this two-day conference is going to inform a national action plan for build back better with girls. Girls and young people are not and should not be treated as passive stakeholders of interventions which affect and influence their lives and choices. And like Krista rightly said, nothing about us without us. So they need to be equal participants in issues that matter to them and issues that affect them. Keeping in mind that spirit, Plan India is going to use the recommendations of all the sessions during these two days, including this one on GBV, to inform this national action plan. So all our speakers on today's panel have already shared a lot of experience and recommendations. And now I want to go back to our expert speakers to share their key recommendations and any closing reflections which you, know, you want to share with our audience and with this group engaged in finalizing the National Action Plan. And whatever you share now as the recommendation, is going to be consolidated tomorrow. We have a plenary where all these sessions that took place today, we are all going to, the chairs are going to come together and then consolidate the recommendations from each panel. So um, I would like to go in the same sequence as we had the speakers speaking up. So any final key recommendations and your final key reflections? Naina Chaudhary will start with you. 
so many times is pretty unnerving. But <laughs> thank you, Renu. Um, my uh, my reflections uh, would be that you know. Uh, if you have to focus on one thing, focus on empowerment, not protection. Never use the word protection in any of your uh, documents, in any of your uh, discussion, discourse, nowhere. Because that's where we still think of the power and the power over. So that's one thing that I really want to make a recommendation to uh, to plan about it. Also listening to the adolescents, which plan does quite a lot, and I'm very hopeful that you'll keep doing it. Our adolescents are asking us to talk to their parents. They are constantly asking us that, you know, can parents not take our questioning as something like we are disobeying them, or it's an insult or something like that? Unless we bring the culture of critical questioning, we are never going to transition from a society which has accepted things in a particular way, including domestic violence, to a society which is equal and empowering for all. So that would be my recommendation to plan. Thank you. Thank you so much, Naina. Um, Dr. Karnika said. You're on mute. Uh, I had certain specific points in my mind. The first one being, you know, where, when we talk about cybersecurity, um, uh, there was a consultation where I uh, met the National Cybercrime Coordinator of India, and we were discussing how the new policy needs to be called out. And uh, protection, like when we talk about protecting women and children, I don't want to use the word protecting, but uh, yes, now empowering children and women. Uh, there, I thought it was very important for us to highlight that, you know, the national cybersecurity policy also should look into this particular area as well, when, uh, you know, issues like cyber terrorism or other uh, kinds of problems which we face on the net are important. Uh, it is also important to address this issue of, you know, crimes against women and children online. So that's one thing which I wanted to highlight that uh, whichever action plan you make, because we can't have a fragmented approach, it has to be uh, something on a national pan-India basis. So uh, having a good cybersecurity policy is it's essential to address this area as well. That's my number one thing. Secondly, um, when we talk about capacity building, um, like NCRT is you know largely followed across so many schools. Uh, that is one of the uh, key bodies, you know, giving out the curriculum and other essentials. Uh, bodies like CBSC or you know ICSE, they have various uh, academic or educational institutions which work towards children and their curriculum and schools they must congregate together also along with NGOs and you know, civil society organizations, which can call out a proper uh, education, cyber education program also. That is going to be an effective way of addressing uh, the capacity building part for schools, especially. Thirdly is uh, the education for uh, you know, training these law enforcement bodies. And um, that again, needs to be more structured uh, having trained these, uh, you know, law enforcement bodies for two decades now, I, I feel strongly that though there are uh, different training sessions we've done from time to time, but they have to be more structured and one has to overall the programs because uh, they cannot be the same. The whole scenario changes, you know, in minutes in, in the cyberspace. So it has to be more robust and it has to be more updated uh, and structured. That is uh, the third suggestion. And fourth is the, the national helplines that we have. Uh, we should also, when we talk about changing the mindsets, asking them to report more, in, you know, incidents, the unfortunately what is happening and that's from my experience i'm telling you that even though during covid or otherwise there is a reporting and made anonymously or even with with their specific names or alias names on the so, uh, cybercrime.gov.in portal there are very few fir's registered very few and that is a challenge not only in cyber uh, cybercrime related space but otherwise also in domestic violence sometimes i've seen that the fir's don't get it to you know uh, the uh, investigation more and it's only a complaint which is there so the effectiveness of law enforcement will only ha happen once there is a good helpline available 
which gives them the right uh, you know uh, way to approach the for the legal or cause sometimes there are free legal aid cells you, you know the nalsa is there the national uh, legal services authority uh, there are state authorities which have free legal aid also for the women who can't afford probably those services to pay their lawyers and other you know advocates so there are pro bono activities you know done and that's uh, a legal recourse which is available also many people don't understand or know about them so that awareness also should go should go so i think all these four five measures will go a long way uh, in uh, addressing this uh, gender based violence and how we can curtail this problem in india thank you so much karnika all well noted excellent points um shalini ji uh we can't hear Joe, that yeah. the importance that is given it it you know it becomes like a movement it comes in public eye because only then it is going to get the attention that it truly deserves so that's the first one uh second i would say is support to the victims uh you know in terms of our shelters financial assistance legal help counseling mental uh, uh you know sessions that are required all of it so that the, so that there's that infrastructure which is available in case there are people who want to find an alternate to being abused so that's the second one that i would say uh the third i've already mentioned question question all gender stereotypes roles that are there in our daily lives uh and find solutions it doesn't mean like like uh, what nana said uh it's not that we are uh, uh, you know we are being disrespectful to our uh, culture or to our parents or our elders uh, or to our religious beliefs we are not doing that but we do need to do it in a very respectful manner question things wherever we feel that as a gender we are not getting the equality that is our birthright and we we should be able to raise those uh the next which already a few people have said which is involve the victims in the strategies because they have gone through it they understand what it is they would help find the solutions which are workable because it's a very complex situation and there, there is no one size fits all here there have to be literally curated responses for each case because each individual is a human being that has its own set of challenges around and needs the solution that works for that particular individual so it's very important we involve them and of course uh involve men until and unless we have the support of the second gender uh there is no way we will be able to achieve it and begin with the support of men that support girls and women rights they also are the money bags the financial economy uh, you know the business and uh, financial world is with them uh, so we need those resources as well so involve them and then do not leave the perpetrators out they are part of the society they need correction as well because if that correction is not done then they again we are marginalizing one one you know little part of our uh, our whole world we can't do that so of uh, definitely some kind of for example if there are shelters and everything for abused victims there should be these groups like uh, uh, on the same lines as uh, aa alcoholic anonymous or of that where there are groups which helps them come out of their challenges that they have and they slowly it's a it's a long process may not happen but at least they still try and get out of the problems that they have as being abusers so that's another area that we can look at and all i can say is i just hope that we can provide the safety to at a place uh, which should be a safe haven which is home i mean that is where we should be safe right i really feel that we are able to and safety when i say here it means the abil ability uh, to live uh, without threat of fear so i i can just hope and pray for it that collectively as human beings as communities as law enforcement as ngos social workers we can put the whole thing together and create that safety net uh, for all uh, human beings uh, 
uh, definitely women and children, because statistics says that they are the ones that ha are, have been uh, the victims, larger victims. Thank you, Shalini ji. Thank you so much. Krista, over to you. Yeah, so I think one of the recommendations I want to make, and it, it's really touching on and echoing what so many of you have said in this session already, but I'm going to kind of put it in some specific policy language, um, which is we need to embrace sustainable development goal number five in its entirety at all levels. You know, one piece of SDG number five is, of course, the elimination of all forms of violence against women and girls. But the larger goal is something I think we don't talk about enough specifically, which is that we need to achieve gender equality and empower all women and girls. And, you know, unless we're going to do all of the different pieces of that, we're not going to achieve any one of the pieces of it. So not only do we need to eliminate all forms of violence against women and girls, we need to eliminate all forms of discrimination against women and girls. Of course, there are harmful practices like child early forced marriage, but we also need to address like unequal burdens of domestic and unpaid care work. We need to ensure women's full and effective participation in leadership at all levels like we talked about early. And so I would just say, let's make sure that we look at all of sustainable development goal number five and make an action plan for how we're going to move forward in its entirety and all of its pieces. And then the other thing I wanted to touch upon was uh, picking up on something I think that Shalini said about collaboration. And you know, there's a United Nations agency that likes to say, uh, oh, sorry, coordination. Coordination saves lives. And I think nowhere is that more true than when it comes to gender-based violence and to women's rights. We have to coordinate in order to save lives. And of course, we need to coordinate as civil society organizations within a country. Um, and we need to um, coordinate across civil society organizations, government, law enforcement. But I would just say we also need to coordinate between countries. There are best practices that different countries have developed that we can learn from one another. And you know, Plan International has um, had a really successful collaboration with, with ASEAN in, in Southeast Asia to hold uh, two uh, regional forums on eliminating child marriage uh, during COVID-19. And we're going to be working with SARC to do something similar in South Asia next year. But I think, you know, as much as one organization and a, and a few allies can reach out, we really wanna hear a groundswell um, of people within the member states for these regional and international bodies saying, no, we need coordination and collaboration on this because no one country can do it alone. And we need to learn what's worked and what hasn't worked in our neighboring states so that we can, you know, not have to recreate the will or uh, you know, make the same uh, trial and error. Um, and so again, yeah, coordination saves lives. Thank you, Krista. And what you said about coordination and you know, the way you've elaborated that, I think it connects so well to uh, what Shalini ji was saying, the one of the recommendation, bringing the issue of GBV up front and central because it needs that kind of focus to, you know, then get all the, you know, policy level, resource level, uh, you know, support. And uh, Shanu, your recommendations? It is also similar to my, hello. My uh, recommendation is also similar to Krista Shalini ji. Uh, basically, we need to do build more partnership, forming a coalition where actually because gender based violence in all its form means it's not only one violence abuses. It's a long list of abuses. 
so maybe that we can work upon as a plan what we are going to do in our geography and how we can partner with other organizations and like we can learn with each other and do the best for the interest of girls and adolescents so that formation of coalition and of course the coordination how we do that i think that's the priority apart from that once this is built up then of course we can think about there are several poorly enforced laws in india so basically then we can work upon that line by line where to work it in which area who is going to support then we can segregate that but yes coalition is the main thing so these are two recommendations from my side thank you thank you so much shanu and thank you all the panelists for those you know really concrete set of recommendations and i'm sure tomorrow's uh, panel consolidating the recommendations would really love these uh, i also wanted to add maybe three recommendations from my side i know uh, the organizers organizers didn't want me to they did not ask me to add my recommendations <laughs> but i'm still adding so one recommendation is a conscious um, um a conscious design on do no harm framework because when we are working on issues around gender based violence we are actually trying to to change and challenge the existing gender power dynamics and then that happens it increases the risk of unintended harm and backlash so all interventions which are working in the space of sexual and reproductive health and gender based violence should also have a, a detailed safety plan and mitigation strategy the projects should do a thorough risk assessment to understand the social cultural political religious uh you know issues that might lead to these so that's one the second uh, recommendation would be um i think we did not hear that much today is the marginalized group uh girls who are living with disability girls who are living with hiv and aids girls who are living in marginalized societies and groups and communities and also the violence that girls who identify themselves as trans and not cis gender uh, the kind of challenges they face and the kind of uh, stigma and gender based violence that comes across to them uh, we need to have some concrete recommendations within the intervention strategies and also the risk assessment and the do no harm frameworks um so that's uh, the second one and the third recommendation it's already covered everyone spoke so vehemently about coordination so i think plan india you are really going to have hands full on this task it's going to be a huge task to coordinate the effort of all the civil society organizations the uh, the uh, you know you know the the grassroots organizations women led uh feminist organizations youth networks they're all doing commendable work on gender based violence so tomorrow we will discuss in the consolidation session about how we are going to move this but today it was wonderful talking to all of you panelists thank you so much for joining today and sharing your experience and sharing your insights and recommendations and um, we will get back to you tomorrow and i think you can also join some of the sessions tomorrow and see you know what's moving on this and uh, plan india will soon finalize their action plan and then i hope that we all get to be a part of this movement until then have a wonderful rest of your day evening night wherever you are in the world and thank you so much